and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, precisionhydration.com. You can get electrolytes in different strengths that match how you sweat. You can get 15% off your first order with the code OxygenAddict15. We're also brought to you by Thriver.co, the simple finger prick blood test you can do at home to track hormone, vitamin, and mineral levels in your body. 10% off all subscriptions with the code OxygenAddict10. All right, everybody, welcome to the show. I hope you're all good today. Today, I'm going to bring you an interview with Sam Appleton. Uh, Sam is a 15-time 70.3 champion, stepped up to race Ironman this year or the back end of 2019. Anyway, raced Western Australia and a lot of you who watched the footage, especially a lot of Brits who are interested in watching Ali Brownlee race his first sort of full official Ironman because obviously he did Ireland, but the swim was cancelled there. Um, Sam was the guy who went toe-to-toe with Ali, got out the water next to him, did turns with him on the bike. So we get the full story there. He, he wasn't quite strong enough to stay with Ali all the way to the finish, but he hung tough. He finished fourth, which is great for a you know, young man and his first Ironman. So he is a really nice lad. He's uh, very professional. I was very impressed by how he's approaching his sort of professional career. And, you know, from my point of view, it it can sometimes be quite challenging to line interviews up to get pros on, actually. Sam was the complete opposite of this. He's a, a really cracking chap, and I think you'll enjoy the interview. Um, right, on with the show today. A few bits and bobs of news brought to us by Precision Hydration. Remember, you can get yourself 15% off your first order with the code OxygenAddict15. If you've never tried it, get over to their website and take their online sweat test. That'll give you a lead as to whether you're a particularly salty or heavy sweater. I swear by this stuff. I am an incredibly salty sweater. My my sweat's got something like 1,650 milligrams of sodium in per litre. So it's like in the very top 5% of how salty sweat can be. I struggle really badly with calf cramps if I'm on the turbo and I don't have electrolyte drinks. I struggle really badly with cramps in the night. I struggled really badly when I was racing and taking it really seriously. If it was ever hot, it was a horror show for me. Long distance races were always a horror show. I was on a drip after every single race. And it turns out it's all down to this pesky sodium. And until precision hydration came along, it was incredibly difficult to get sodium back in your body. You could take salt tabs, but salt tabs I used to have had 250 milligrams in. So I would have needed to have taken six at a time with every bottle of water. I mean, I was lucky if I took six during the whole leg of an Ironman bike leg. So for me now, I know that I need to be putting 1500 milligram sachets into each 750 mil bottle. And I can really tell the difference. If I have it on the turbo, I'm absolutely great. I don't get cramp during the session and I don't get cramp at night. Just takes one turbo session for me without having it in my water bottles. And it's just a horror show at the end of the session. I get a cramp or I definitely get it in the night. So I just got a nice big parcel arrived from the uh, team at PH just last week. Topped at my supplies because I've been without it for about a week. So uh, I am incredibly grateful. So anyway, long way to say if if you're struggling with cramp or if you're finding yourself like really struggling to replace the fluids you're replacing after a turbo session if it's hot and sweaty inside or you're training outside and it's hot and sweaty these days it might be that adding in that sodium helps the water absorb into your body faster so get on it prisonhydration.com use the code oxygenatic 15 link is in the show notes all right so stuff i've seen in the news this week first up um news from the pto they have partnered with challenge brazil to offer sixty thousand dollar prize purse for challenge brazil which is the race that happens in florianopolis it's scheduled for the uh the week before when the pto race in challenge daytona is going to happen so that event's going to be the 4th to the 6th of december so this one's going to be the very end of november um now this is a really interesting move on the pto's part put big prize money up they're obviously really hoping that brazil is going to be open and going to be safe by that time as things stand at the minute i don't think there are many countries in the world who have got such high infection rates as brazil have got you certainly can't travel out at the moment from the uk or the us i don't think at the moment um so it's a big call to offer that money hopefully you know if it's all calmed down a bit by then it'd make a great back-to-back racing weekend for people to go and race challenge brazil first and then head over to daytona and race for the big million dollar prize purse there so i guess we will you know we will see nearer the time but hats off to the pto they're obviously doing a lot of stuff 
to give hope and encouragement to the athletes. I was talking to Kimberly Morrison just earlier today, did an interview with her that'll be out, I think, probably next week or the week after. And she was saying that they've played a big part in keeping her sane during this time, just in terms of giving her messaging about stay insane and you know there's races coming so as well as providing financial support i think it sounds like the pto genuinely are doing a good job of um of communicating with pro triathletes as well so uh, so yeah watch this space we'll see whether that happens other news i saw on instagram you'll know we had richard murray on the show a few episodes back uh, and that was just on the back of him going under 14 minutes for uh, for 5k He's just broken eight minutes for 3K. Now, to put in context how quick that is, I went to the British Athletics website, the Power of 10 website, that if you've not used it, it lists all of the best times broken down by age, gender, age group, year group. Brilliant piece of website to look at if you're a stats geek like I am. Um, He ran 7.58 for a 3K on the road. He was running behind his partner on a bike. So he was being paced, but fair play. That is a legit time for a a legit measured distance on a road. 7.58 would have ranked him 11th in the UK last year on 3K running on the track against competition. So that goes to show quite how quick it is. I had a look at PBs and stuff like that. Mo Farah's PB is like low 7.30s. Most British, you know, legit British track runners are running in the low 740s. So he is not a million miles away from those kind of times. Now, if he's running 758 and a race is one in 740, he's going to be 18 seconds back. That's probably 110, 120 meters back down the track at that kind of pace. So it's not, you know, it's, that is world-class running from Richard Murray. And hats off to him. He's obviously hit a purple patch he's keeping himself inspired by doing stuff that he feels he's up to and he really wants to go and do and more importantly than that i think like hats off to him for putting together some really good homemade youtube videos to watch as well i found it really inspiring watching that so maybe you want to go and check that out over on his instagram feed uh well worth well worth a bit of a, a watch as you're getting warmed up in the turbo ready for a, a smash fest on swift And something else I want to mention as well to you, if you haven't seen the documentary on ESPN Play, ESPN have launched this 30 for 30 series of documentaries, some very good stuff on there. They've got a two-part documentary called Lance about Lance Armstrong, which I've watched over this week. Uh, It's two 90-minute episodes, so it's great for watching when you're putting these miles in on the bike, on the turbo. It's just great viewing in general. It's a really well-put-together piece of documentary evidence. Um, or documentary filmmaking. It's got interviews with all of the main players from the time, uh, all of his family, his partners, ex-partners, ex-girlfriends, really paints an interesting picture of Lance. And I was a bit concerned going into it that it was, you know, is it going to be a bit of a puff piece? And it is not at all. There's a twist at the end in the last 10 minutes that really completely blew my mind. I sent a video clip of it to my two or three closest friends and said like, I really did not expect that to happen because all the, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but all the way through this documentary, Lance paints a, a pretty, you know, there's no revelations there. There's the stuff about his childhood. That's pretty unpleasant. You know, he had a stepfather that beat the crap out of him a lot and formed him into the person that he is today in Lance's own words, um, beat the crap out of him a lot. Um, so there's that interesting angle, but all the way through it's, it's pretty, unsympathetic towards him in terms of you know the he says he regrets doing things he doesn't come across as though he's regretted saying things you know you can say the word sorry but not come across like you mean it and vice versa and it paints quite a quite an uncompromising picture of him and it sets up for the last 10 minutes so honestly it is worth watching that and you have to watch the whole thing just don't fast forward to the last 10 minutes because without the setup it won't make any sense but it was. It's a brilliant piece of filmmaking. I highly recommend you go and watch. ESPN players like ten quid a month or something, but you can get a seven day free trial and and watch it on there. But I'd recommend going and checking out. If you're in America and you like American football and basketball, there's tons of really good stuff on that. So well worth checking out. And obviously, we're not sponsored by them or anything. I'm just saying, it's good stuff to watch. 
Okay, coaches couch this week. Um, I'm going to talk you guys through some ideas I've shared with our team Oxygen Addicts athletes ahead of racing virtual races. Loads of our team are racing the Lakesman lockdown events this weekend. And if you're entered into that, brilliant. Um, Phil Whitehead and Maria's wife, the team behind Lakesman, I think is a cracking race. I've raced Lakesman half a couple of years ago. Phil, a lot of you will know, is... Um, really high quality athlete himself he's been to Kona a bunch of times he put on the race he wants to do it's in a beautiful setting the Lakesman set in uh, in Keswick beautiful swim around an island great bike course great run course just loads to love it's it's a really really good non-branded event um, and again I've got no I've got no links with this company at all I just really rate them and I rate them as people um, so I'm going to do this Lakesman lockdown it was 20 quid to enter and you get a t-shirt included in that so they're not doing it for the money I'm doing it to support them and say you know you're a good company I want you to still be around the next year so they're doing the Lakesman events either full distance or half distance it's only a bike and run. There's no swim involved in it. Um, and you can do it either as one full event or you can do it broken up over a weekend. And all you've got to do is record your times on GPS devices to prove that you've done it. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how it goes this weekend. Um, I'm not doing it to race. I'm doing it with a friend of mine. We're going to have a great time. I'm really looking forward to it. And it's actually given me a kick in the ass to do some training over the last few weeks. So I've done a couple of longer runs and a couple of longer rides just to be able to be confident I'm going to get through the distance essentially but I think that's what's really good about these virtual races if you if you pick one out four weeks in the future it can give you something that will make the difference between going training or not on a day when you might not have done that training so yeah I'm really inspired to go and do it so anyway we've got a whole bunch of athletes from Team Oxygen Addict doing it all the way through from people who are just doing it for fun, like me, over a spread out over a weekend, to people who are really lining up the tapering for it and they're going to try and really go and give it the best shot. And it's formed something to focus their training on over the last four to six weeks, which is great. So I'm going to give you the, the kind of guidance for all of those different kinds of athletes here. Um, so first of all, I mentioned... The guidance is going to be different depending on whether you're approaching it as a flat out race it on the same day or doing it for fun over the weekend or flat out racing but do bike Saturday and run Sunday. Um, and we built everyone's training plans up in the background so we're confident they're going to be able to get through 90k on the bike and the duration of the run is going to get them up to about an hour 45 or two hours in the run-ups the event so we're sure that they're going to be able to might be a bit of a jump for some of them in duration but still it's not going to be too much of a massive jump in terms of duration um if you're just doing it for fun you're not going to really need much by the way of a taper for an event might be an idea to ease back on the friday but other than that i don't think you need to change your training just do you use you know do the, the bike and the run at the weekend as sort of part of your usual scheduled weekend and it shouldn't really feel that different um you should also be able to roll back into your training the following week after you know an easy day on monday maybe an easy day on tuesday as well but you probably should be okay to roll back onto your usual schedule training on tuesday for the people who are racing the event we've got some kind of guidance around the taper so what we'll say is uh, and this is aimed at people who are going to be doing race day on saturday thursday total rest day friday you're going to do just a short workout either a 20 minute easy run with some relaxed 50 meter faster runs within that or a little bit of a bike session based around the same kind of thing probably do four by 50 meter strides on the run where you're running fast but controllably fast just to shake your legs out the day before the race saturday's going to be race day sunday total rest monday total rest Tuesday, you probably do a 30 minute recovery spin at 55% of a, a functional threshold power or zone one heart rate. So, a really easy spin just to flush the blood through your legs. If you're sore and tired two days after the race, it's usually a good idea to do something like that on the bike rather than nothing because it's going to help you recover faster. And then from Wednesday onwards, ease yourself back onto the usual training schedule, obviously, depending on whether or not you are feeling back up for it. Usually if it's anything, it's it's going to be run sessions that suffer the week after a half iron distance race or full distance race. I'd advise not running at all for a week after a full distance race and probably not running until maybe the Thursday of the week after a half distance race. Now, in terms of pacing, 
if you're not racing, then ride the bike ride at sort of zone two heart rate or about 70% of FTP. That's your usual steady ride or conversational pace intensity. And you're going to do the run at sort of mid E pace and do it as a nine one run walk. So again, nothing's really changing there from your usual weekend workouts. If you're racing, my usual pacing guidelines for a half are between 75% to 85% of FTP. Faster athletes at the higher end, slower athletes at the lower end. Okay, so faster athletes are going to be able to crank out an 85% of FTP ride and still run well off the bike. If you're out there for, you know, north of three hours, three hours, 15, you're going to be want to be close to 75% of FTP. There's a lot of feel involved in it. And remember that what feels sustainable at the start of the ride might not feel quite so sustainable 90 minutes in. And it's much better to start a bit conservatively and then build yourself up rather than go out too fast and blow yourself apart. And very few people at the moment are in peak condition to race a race. So again, being a little bit more conservative is going to pay you dividends with that on the run. Now, normally your best case scenario is to be able to cover the whole run at M pace. And remember all the guidance for all this is on the Oxygen Addict website. You can just go to oxygenaddict.com forward slash V dot. And that'll give you all this information all based on Dr. Jack Daniels's run paces. So M pace is his, his marathon race pace. It's really, it's a really stretch marathon race pace. It's faster than most triathletes can ever hope to run a marathon at. So, I found that M pace is a really good 70.3 race pace for a half distance marathon. Now, given that no one's really going to be in peak condition for an event like this, I'm going to advise people split the difference between your M pace and your E pace. For a guy like me, there's about a minute a mile difference between my M pace and the fastest end of my E pace. So to put some numbers on that, it might be marathon pace at seven minutes a mile, E pace at eight minutes a mile. I'm suggesting split the difference and run at seven and a half minutes a mile. Do that for the first half of the run. And I'm going to advise you to take a 30 second walk break every nine and a half minutes. So basically walk 30 seconds every 10 minutes during the first half. Then if you're in good shape, you can race the second half, do a continuous run and go as hard as you can. Tempo runs to the finish. Your pacing on the bike leg is going to go a long way to determining whether or not you can actually push on on the back half of the run. If you can, great. If you can't, well, it's a learning point that at this level of fitness at the moment, on this day, you weren't up to riding as hard as you could, on the, as hard as you did on the bike. Okay. Now, remember, it's going to feel really hard the last 5K, no matter whether you pace it well or not. You're only going to see a result in your pace. If your pace is is really dramatically dropping off in that last 5K, it's a good lead that you've paced probably the first half of the bike a bit too hot. And just remember, you're going to have to look after your own calories and hydration. So 750 milliliter bottle of fluid per hour. I'm advising getting yourself a sachet of precision hydration in there as well. For myself, I'm on the 1500 milligram sachet, so I'll have one of those in every bottle. I'll take a couple of spare sachets if I've got to stop at a supermarket and fill up my bottles. And I'm going to have 250 calories per hour of calories as well. So that'll be split either between gels mixed in a water bottle with water and some solid food like cereal bars or flapjacks. So that's a good benchmark, but everybody's going to be different. Don't try anything new on race day, but you are going to need something by way of calories in there. Take more liquid if you need it, if it's hot, but be careful with adding more calories because if anything's going to go wrong, it's going to be because you've had too many calories. You're going to end up feeling sick or need the toilet. You can always add a few more calories in and grab a can of Coke if you need it. If you take far too much in, there's only, well, there's two ways it's coming out, but neither of them are very pleasant. Okay, so hopefully that's going to cover all the, the stuff that I've talked through. And I'm aware I'm talking to a lot of the athletes I coach here. It's really just to say that's a reiteration of what we've talked about within our private Facebook group. Go out there and have a great time. I'm a big fan of finding a virtual event to do at the moment. So build up for something over the next few weeks if you haven't done anything. It's a really good way to get yourself focused. And who knows, it's looking like some of the races are maybe going to be taking place in August time. I've heard rumors that Cotswold 113 have put a really solid socially distancing plan in place. And they're sending emails out that sound really, really hopeful. So, you know, check that out if they're not full already. It's sounding like things are heading in the right direction. So maybe it's time to start cranking the training up a little bit. And uh, who knows, maybe we'll have some racing action back on this time sometime 
in the next month or so. Um, if you want a bit of virtual racing, come and join us on Zwift. Tuesdays, 7.15 p.m. UK time is the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast Power Hour. This is a workout that I've written, structured interval training based around your particular FTP. It's guaranteed to improve your bike power, so I'll give you a faster and more powerful bike leg if you race this year or you know, even if you're racing next year, those gains are going to last for the rest of your athletic life. Once you've built that FTP, even if you get a bit out of shape, it's much easier to get back to a previous level of fitness than it is to build a new level of fitness. So it's never wasted if you build up that fitness now. Okay, so if you want to come train with us, it's a great workout. Bunch rides around Zwift together. Everyone gives each other a bit of banter and it's much easier to get the hard work done in a group than it is to get it done on your own. Um, there's no particular link to follow for that, guys. You can just search for us on um, search for us on Swift. So you've got to do look in the uh, look in the section of events on the right hand side in Swift when you log in. Usually, I advise logging in about seven o'clock. That gives Swift a bit of time and gives you a bit of time as well. If you join the event before the event starts. You'll just come and join us all in the starting pen. All of your bikes are on turbo trainers in the virtual world, which is pretty cool. And then off we go. So, yeah, come and join us. Something else we're trying this week as well, actually, although listeners can't join this. It's just for team members and coached athletes. We're going to do one of the team time trial efforts on Thursday evening. So, you know, if you want to do this, get a team together yourself. Check it out within Zwift. It looks like it's going to be really fun. All right, guys, this week's interview of the week is, as I've mentioned earlier, it's going to be with Sam Appleton. But before we do it, I'm going to give a shout out to to our sponsors, Thriver.co. If you're interested in what's going on in your body and you want to have a blood test done, it's traditionally been really hard to get to the GPs and get it done. You always get referred on to the hospital for a blood to be taken. Thriver have changed all of that. They post out a kit to you, you do a simple finger prick, you squeeze five or six drops of blood from your little finger into a tiny test tube, you label the test tube, you put it in a pre-labeled plastic bag, you can have it back in the post box. I've actually done this, right, from start to finish, from opening the box to posting it in the post box at the end of my road took me 10 minutes so it's not a hassle to have this done and you can personalize a blood test to have anything you want checked so it's awesome you can check your blood iron levels your blood cell count testosterone level liver function vitamin b9 b12 vitamin d or if you're even interested in tracking health they do thyroid function diabetes cholesterol omega-3 omega-6 personalize the test yourself you only pay for the tests that you have done each test is you know between six and eight quid to add on or six and twelve quid so you can personalize exactly what you want you can just have one test done you can have the test done on basically whatever schedule you want every three to six months seems to be a really good time to have the testing redone and yeah right back earlier in last year i was really unwell and it was a massive part of me getting my health and diet back on track was having these tests done and to see how ridiculously low my my vitamin b9 and b12 were my vitamin d levels so it was a game changer for me so if you're maybe not feeling quite so perky check it out they're also rumored they sent their email out this week to say they're hoping that they're going to have their coronavirus antibody test kits approved to have out in the next couple of weeks as well so watch this space for that all right guys links in the show notes you get 10 percent off all subscriptions with the code oxygenatic 10 as well Okay, here we go over to this week's interview of the week with Sam Appleton. Okay, Sam Appleton joins us. Sam, how are you doing today, mate? Good, thanks, Rob. Thanks for having me on. Are you uh, you joining us from sunny Boulder, Colorado at the moment? I am, yeah. It's uh, it's actually perfect kind of weather at the moment. Um, yeah, perfect training weather. It's warm, it's hot and sunny. We came out of a pretty uh, pretty bad winter, but yeah, definitely the summer's here and it, it, it feels nice. Good stuff, mate. So how long have you been based over in Boulder for then? Because obviously you're, a, you're an Aussie by birth and you've had a lot of success in the, the races down that way. How long have you been over in Boulder training for? So I came over in 2015 uh, with a good friend of mine, Tim Burkle. We came over um, after the Australian season and I thought, you know, I'd give my shot at the uh, the North American summer and uh, try and kind of make a a name for myself uh, over here because at that point I'd just had some kind of domestic results. Um, So yeah, I came over in 2015 and um, as fate would have it, I actually met uh, my now wife 
uh, pretty early on. Um, so she's American and, uh, yeah, I guess that was kind of, uh, the, uh, the instigator and what made me stay here for the, uh, I've pretty much based myself here for the last five years. I still go back to Australia whenever I can and race and see the family. And I still think it's important to kind of maintain a presence down there um, through racing and sponsors and things like that. But yeah, I do spend most of my time now here in Boulder and uh, yeah, I've got a nice little setup and I love the training. I love the lifestyle here. So definitely no complaints. Yeah, it is. It is meant to be the triathletes mecca, isn't it? To move to Boulder. It is. It is. And um, I think when people come here for the first time, they realize why. Just the, the infrastructure is great. It's got, you know, six or seven swimming pools within a five mile radius. And the riding's great. Um, you know, there's bike lanes in pretty much every every road that you want to take. There's, uh, the, the cars are mostly respect, um, respectful towards cyclists here. I think the cycling culture is kind of embedded into the uh, into this the city and then it's got great running trails as well so it's uh as long as you can get through kind of that snowy winter period um yeah the summers are really great here nice and it looks like that the riding's amazing there's a lot of there's a lot of really good sort of mountainy climbing type areas just on the outskirts of the city from what i've seen i've never been there but i'd, I'd love to go yeah, so it's pr- uh, so we're at sixteen hundred meters elevation, and Boulder's kind of nestled right at the base of the uh, the foothills um, of the Rocky Mountains, essentially. So I can ride, you know, fifteen minutes from my place and hit uh, a canyon that could take me all the way up to you know over three thousand meters, and that's just you know fifteen minute ride from my doorstep. I can head straight up a you know, a 90 minute to two hour climb that just gradually weaves its way up to, uh, to yeah, over 3000 meters. So it's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, especially this time of year, it's starting to heat up and uh, the snow's melting. Um, yeah, it's, it's great. Everything's so green at the moment. It's, uh, it's kind of hard not to, uh, not to get fit here at this time of year. Yeah. So how did you find, um, obviously the altitude 1600 meters to put that in context, that's about the same height as the base station at the summit of Alpe d'Huez. So for anyone who's watched the Tour de France, the climb, I used to live there as a snowboarder back in the day. So the climb of Alpe d'Huez takes you to 1600 meters. And that felt really high to me. I remember getting there and being like, I'm knackered after just walking down the street. So how did you find it coming from sea level to, to living at 1600 meters? Yeah, it was definitely a bit of a shock. Um, When I first came here in 2015, I lived in this house that had, you know, quite a few stairs. It was a three-level house, and I would just get winded walking up and down the (laughs) stairs that first couple of weeks. Um, But I guess because I've been here so long, I don't really notice it now. Um, And I think 1,600 metres is kind of – it's almost that happy medium where it's high enough for you to get the altitude benefits, but it's also not – um, like you can still go out and do that really high intense speed work and things like that. Like your heart rate and stuff will be higher. Yeah. Um, but I can still go to the track and do, you know, one K reps, um, at a, yeah, really high intensity, um, similar to what I do at sea level. Yeah. So, and then you also got the option if you do want to go up higher, you, you know, I can do a four hour ride and spend two hours above 3000 meters, um, if I go up in the mountains. So, um, yeah, there's kind of quite a bit of options available and, uh, I haven't really, yeah, I don't really notice the altitude anymore. I guess it's kind of the norm for me. Uh, even when I go back to Australia and I, uh, for a month or so, and then I come back, uh, I pretty much fall straight back into the rhythm okay. here. So do you, do you think it helps when you go back to race at sea level? Do you, do you feel like you notice a difference in terms of when you get back down there for a few days afterwards? Is there that kind of magical window of feeling awesome i think sometimes um i mean i think it's it's also a bit hyperbolic you know um a bit um sorry not hyperbolic what's the word i'm looking for a bit um, psychosomatic like yeah yeah okay perhaps. um definitely some sessions like if i go up and i spend a weekend up in the mountains uh for like a high altitude camp and i come back to boulder the first couple of swim sessions i might feel like oh you know i feel like i got a bit more oxygen here um, but when I go, like, say if I come from Boulder and I go to sea level to race, 
like it still feels hard you know what i mean yeah. like i'm not going <laughs> to a race in uh, in california and in the swim going oh how good is this it feels easy um <laughs> like it still it still feels hard so um but i definitely do think that there's um a benefit there but sometimes it can be hard to kind of yeah um fully identify with that with that benefit yeah okay so you're primarily known at the moment as a 70.3 athlete you've had let me get this right 15 15 wins at 70.3 is that right is that still yeah, correct? yeah i think so yeah about about 15 awesome um, so yeah it's uh yeah kind of ever since 2015 where i kind of yeah, I kind of just stepped up a level, I guess. Um, you know, I went from some domestic kind of podiums in Australia to then kind of breaking through. And it's, yeah, it's been a nice sort of five years, um, yeah, in the 70.3 scene. Yeah. Was was it, like, was it a, a big decision to kind of go, right, I need to make the step up now? I've, I've been successful, you, you say domestically. Obviously, Australia's mm-hmm. very, very deep in terms of talent so if you can be successful there you got a good shot of being successful internationally but I imagine mm-hmm. th- there must have come a point where you thought right okay I've got to I've got to do something to get to the next level what what was that point for you I think um you know I was working at a bike shop and I um I was at university as well back in Australia and I was kind of just you know I was committed to triathlon but I also had a lot of of other things going on. I felt like, and I felt like I was kind of spreading myself a little bit too thin. Um, and then I started actually working with a coach, uh, Tim Reed, who was the 2016 70.3 world champion. And, um, he's a good friend of mine. And then we started kind of working together as coach athlete. And, um, I guess he kind of saw a bit of potential in me and yeah, he kind of sat me down and said, look, let's, you know, give it a real shake here. And then, yeah, so I did and I took that leap and I think a lot of it was partially mental as well. I think the fitness was there and the the ability was there, but then, yeah, it kind of takes almost like a catalyst. Um, and for me, I think that was, uh, I think it was 2015, I raced Geelong 70.3 and uh, I had a pretty much a sprint finish with Craig Alexander and that was kind of like almost like a turning point where I was like, hang on a sec, you know, this is... Yeah, this is Chloe. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Maybe it's, uh, I can give this triathlon business a bit more of a shake and uh, yeah, and then I guess it's been a bit of a whirlwind the last five years and uh, here I am. It's kind of hard to, you know, actually nut out when was that, um, you know, when was that deciding change in my... uh, I guess in my mental state in racing and training, but yeah, yeah, I guess I just keep kind of plugging away and keep, uh, yeah, kept training hard and the consistent results just followed. Okay. Who were your heroes growing up? Who did you, who did you look up to as a young triathlete? Uh, I definitely think Craig Alexander as a, as an Australian and seeing him, um, you know, be so dominant at 70.3s, I think, uh, I was having a laugh with him the other day when uh, he's won like something like 50 or 60, 70.3s or wow. something. Wow. Um, and then obviously his his world titles. So growing up at, as an Australian, it's it's kind of hard not to idolise someone like Craig. And I think just not the way he races, but all the way, uh, the way he carries himself, um, you know, as a person and as a professional. And he's always given me time, um, even, you know, back when I was really young. I think that's... Uh, in my in my books, that's kind of the true hallmarks of a champion, not just the race results, but also the way you carry yourself off the field. And I think Craig is, uh, yeah, the epitome of a, of a champion. And how was it then being shoulder to shoulder with your childhood with your childhood idol in a sprint finish? It was kind of surreal, actually. Uh, yeah, I, I bet. Kind of, um, so it was 2015, and I guess I wasn't super well known and. We got off the bike and I was like, oh, I'll just run with him for, you know, three or four K, see what happens. And then I got kind of got to five K through. I'm like, oh, I'll just get through halfway and see where I'm at and got through halfway. And then I kept kind of just promising myself, oh, another, another K, another K. And then, yeah, sure enough, we got kind of right down to the wire. And he, uh, he, you know, I think in that situation, Craig knows how to win races, you know, he, uh, 
he's he's definitely savvy and he knows how to win. He wouldn't be as, that successful if he didn't. So uh, yeah, he got the better of me that day. But I think over the last couple of years, I've uh, I've managed to get a couple back on him, which has been quite nice. Yeah, well, he's nearly as old as me these days, so you'd hope so. Joe, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing that blows my mind is, like, his name is still coming up in results, still winning stuff, still podiuming. And he, he must be, is he 44 this year, 45 maybe? So, yeah, I think something like that. I raced him in Geelong in February before um, kind of everything got shut down and uh, – you know, he's definitely always one to watch. I wasn't, yeah. uh, he, he was at the forefront of my mind as someone to beat in that race. So yeah, he's still got it. Absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Um, all right. So you've had some great success at the 70.3 world championships. You've finished in the top 10, is it four times in the last four years? I think so. Yeah. You've had, I've got some notes here that PH sent yeah. through. You had fifth, the fourth, okay. the sixth and an eighth. Yeah, unfortunately, that's kind of the wrong direction, isn't it? <laughs> the, uh, kind of getting uh, lower and lower in the top ten. But I think it's just a testament to the, uh, you know, the competition. Every year, it's getting harder and harder. And I actually feel like I've probably raced better each year, despite my position um, slipping a little bit. <clears throat> um, but it's um, so deep, though, isn't it, man? The competition at the seventy point three championships is. We had. Um, Gustav Eden on a few weeks back oh, yeah. and he was saying it's just it's just a lottery like I turned around there was nobody there you know where's my training partner gone I was expecting him to be right there with me and all of a sudden I've got this break and we're away kind of thing so yep. he was very much of this opinion that there are there are 15 of us who could win this thing on any given day and luck's going to play a part and preparation plays a part but it's just such a deep level of competition. It is, yeah. And I think a race like Nice, um, you know, it was so much more up in the air with the uh, just the way that course was with the climb yeah. and then the descent. Um, there was a lot more that kind of went into it than just pure fitness. Um, mm. So, yeah, I think it was a great, a great course and I really enjoyed being a part of it and being in the race for as, you know, as long as I can. It was, yeah, kind of nice to be a part of it. And um, I feel like Nice wasn't necessarily a course that suited me. Um, but, yeah, I was still really happy with the with the result that I had. And um, to me, it's like positions are nice and winning is nice and, you know, being up there is nice. But I also, you know, to gauge my performance, it's more about my kind of the way that I raced and if I put my best foot forward and things like that. And I was actually really happy with my race at Nice, despite it being eighth, which is not my best over the 70.3 worlds. I think it was one of the best races that I've actually raced at a 70.3 championship. Yeah. And was there a lot of foot racing going on at the end of that for you? It looked from the coverage that there were, there were packs of guys hammering each other all mm -hmm. the way, you know, like groups of two and three really surging. It was mini races going on. Yeah, especially, yeah, in the run, I think I went from, you know, I was in fifth or sixth at one point, and then I dropped back to 12th, and then there was just, like, all these people, and, um, yeah, it was really, really close. If you look at the actual run time, the, like, the um, the end results, besides Gustav and Ali um, and Rudy, they were up, up the road a little bit, I think, from, like, fourth mm. to ninth was all really really close so um yeah i remember kind of position switching in that last 5k from you know i was in 11th and then i was in seventh and then i was in eighth and then, yeah <laughs> um but yeah it's kind of kind of nice to have that fight all the way to the end and every position matters so um you know it wasn't like one of those races where the positions are decided with 5k to go so people kind of you know switch off their brains it was uh yeah, it was one of those ones where you where you hammer and tong all the way to the finish. Yeah, and is that your favourite kind of racing? Seventy point three or the hammer and well, tong to the finish? The, the kind of yeah, shoulder to shoulder, you got to battle right to the line it kind of thing. It definitely brings out the best. Um, you know, at times you might be like, oh, I wish I was, you know, <laughs> in my own clear space, like no one in front, no one behind, where I can just kind of mentally relax and maybe back it off a couple of seconds, okay. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, when you finish and you're absolutely spent and, um, everyone's been fighting, 
uh, all the way to the end, it's uh, it's definitely a more satisfying conclusion. Yeah, nice. And then you made the step up to racing full distance Ironman at Western Australia mm-hmm. in Bustleton back at the end of yep. 2019. And you had a pretty epic swim bike battle with Ali Brownlee, didn't you, in that event? Mm-hmm. Talk us through your first Ironman. How was your experience there? Yeah, so it was kind of something that I kind of just decided uh, towards the end of last year. I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm 29. Well, I was 29 at that point. I'm 30 now. But I'm like, oh, it might be time to do an Ironman. I've been putting it off for a couple of years. And I thought something in December is quite low risk because, um, you know, if something happens and it takes me two months to recover from it, um, you know, it's not going to impact the 2020 season. Um, so yeah, I kind of just decided to do Ironman Western Australia. I wanted to do it in Australia as well. I think that was important as an Australian. It kind of wanted to go, go home and, uh, and do my first Ironman. So, uh, yeah. And it definitely was a, was an experience. That's for sure. I remember, um, kind of chatting to Ali Brownlee before the race and he goes, he goes, ah, what's your plan for this race? And I'm like, Mate, I've got no idea. This is my first Ironman. I'm going <laughs> to ask me again halfway through the ride. Um, because at that point, I think my longest ride that I'd done was a 160K and I think a 30K run or something. So I I must admit, I did go in not underdone, but as well prepared as I could with the lead up that I had. Um, and and yeah, I, I kind of thought the swim would be fine, uh, which it was. And then I didn't actually think that I'd ride as well as I did. I thought I'd get to maybe three quarters of the way through, um, you know, 120, 140K and the wheels start coming off. But, yeah, I felt really good on the bike. And Ali and I worked really well together for the whole ride and we rode really well. And then I got off for the run and uh, I felt good like everyone probably does in that first 10, 15K. Everyone says it feels easy and um, – I was just trying to run that four minute K pace and I thought I'd be able to run that for maybe 30 kilometers before kind of slowing down. And, uh, unfortunately though, I got to about 20 K and that's when my body was like, hang on, this is a lot longer than what, what I'm used to. And, um, yeah, I still obviously had a half marathon <laughs> to, to get through. And I think, uh, I think I went through the first half marathon in one twenty three. And then the second half marathon was 145. So it was uh, a lot of walk running that back half of the run. But um, it was still something I really enjoyed. You know, it was one of those, yeah. it sounds cliche and I'm sure a lot of people say it, but it was such an internal battle um, despite what I'm used to um, in contrast with 70.3 where you're kind of pitting yourself against people and basing your race off these other people. It was one of those um yeah just kind of long solo days where you just uh you, your biggest enemy is is your mind i guess and overcoming that and i kind of enjoyed that to be honest it was uh something different than what i'm used to and i'm i was definitely really excited to do another one this year but now with everything that's going on who knows what's going to happen yeah. so um, yeah i'm i'm really looking forward to doing another an, another one and i think uh I definitely know what I need to work on, that muscle resilience and just that, that pounding for the marathon. Um, but other than that, I felt pretty good. Um, like my nutrition was fine. My breathing and heart rate was fine. It was just the that muscle deterioration in the legs in that last 15K was <laughs> It's a pretty, horrendous. pretty damn solid debut, though. It's coming at your first Ironman. And uh, I mean, I, I watched a bit of the... Uh, a bit of the footage from the the Ironman website before we did the interview. And I remember looking at it at the time, because obviously from the British interest point of view, Ali Brownlee has gone over and he's trying to put his, it was effectively his first really effective Ironman, that one in Western Australia. He'd he'd done Dublin, but there'd been no swim. He'd been to Kona and kind of, you know, detonated a bit on the run. And so he went out there and, uh, and you and him on the bike, I mean, there's some great sections of footage and you and him on those Bustleton roads looking so quick. And you're like tucked right down on the giant bike, hair and mm-hmm. away and taking it in terms with him. So I was watching that going, man, that's that's some debut Ironman to, to be doing your first race and to be putting the kind of power out that you guys were doing. Yeah, um, I guess I was always 
going to swim and bike pretty hard. That's my strength. And, um, you know, in hindsight, I don't think that I went too hard on the bike. I actually felt quite good. Um, but yeah, the course at Bustleton is flat and fast, but that's all not always easier. You know, Definitely. it doesn't have elevation. So yeah. you're kind of tucked in that aero position using the same muscle group for you can't over move out hours. of it can you no you can't exactly. get out of the aero position at all um so people often say oh it's flat it's easy but then you know if you've got a course with some hills and things you can you know you get out of the aero position you sw- slide back in the saddle you recruit your glutes and your hamstrings a little more um but yeah it was a it, it was a great um a great swim bike for me and ali and i were really kind of great at working together and um after the race yeah he was really thankful for me and i was really thankful for him as well because i didn't fancy being out there by myself so uh yeah it was kind of kind of nice to get that recognition from someone like ali as well yeah did you know him much before the race obviously you'll have crossed paths at a couple of different events yeah but... um i've spoken to him a few times and we know each other um yeah just from racing uh, yeah. i've raced a number of times now and i actually uh Years ago, I raced ITU against his brother, uh, Johnny. We're the same age. So we we raced against each other quite a bit. And then, yeah, now in 70.3, I'm racing Ali quite a bit now yeah. as well. And, uh, yeah, I think I've raced, it, raced Ali uh, five or six times. And I think, you know, triathlon such so great in the fact that we're all competitors, but transition the morning before um the race everyone you know everyone's saying hello how you going it's kind of it's got it's definitely got that friendly camaraderie about it for sure as well yeah well you went 809 in Mm -hmm. your first ironman which like it blows my mind how much the level seems to have moved forward just over the last couple of years because even getting close to eight hours a decade ago was like a whoa look at that kind of Mm -hmm. performance and now you look at it and go, well, you've done this on debut, just kind of having a go at your first Ironman without really feeling that you're properly prepared for it. <laughs> um, do you look at do you look at the times people are putting out and think, yeah, I think if I have a if I have a good one and hold together, like you say, you you trotted through the halfway point in in one twenty three, was it? You said, yeah, I think so. You might have to double check, but it was around around there, around that area. So yeah. Um, and I knew that was maybe a little bit too fast. Like I, I knew that I wouldn't run um, 245, 246. I knew that's too fast. I thought I would m- maybe be able to run somewhere between, you know, that 252 to 256. That was yeah. kind of what I was hoping. Um, but, yeah, I just lost so much time in that last 10K. I was walking every aid station. And once you start walking one aid station, it's it's hard to keep running through the next ones. And, uh, <laughs> It's hard to get running again. Um, but at that point, I was just like, I just need to get to the finish. Yeah. I, you, get I the proper, even, you get the proper experience I, of Ironman, don't you? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I wouldn't change anything about it. I, uh, I had a great time. And even as soon as I finished, I was looking forward to doing another, another one because I know that I've got so much improvement. And I think that's what is exciting, you know, it, um, at my level in 70.3 improvements are so minuscule that they can be hard to quantify sometimes. Um, but yeah, that kind of excites me about the Ironman um, aspirations is the fact that I, I can improve so much and I know where I need to get to. So that excites me. Nice. And is that where you think your, your sort of ambitions lie over the next few years? Can you see yourself focusing more on the long distance stuff? I think so. Um, I've always been drawn to Ironman. Um, I just wanted to be patient. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I kind of squeezed everything I could out of 70.3. And I, I do still think that there's improvements for me in 70.3. And I do think, um, I do still think that I can, uh, you know, step up another level at the world championships for 70.3. So that, that will probably remain my focus for at least the next two years. Um, but that's not to say that I'm not going to throw in, you know, some Ironmans in there as well and uh, kind of start my apprenticeship in the Ironman field. And then, uh, yeah, eventually um, Kona, it's always been a dream of mine. Um, I watch it. I've been there a couple of times. And, um, yeah, that that really excites me. Going and racing Kona is something, um, yeah, that gets me out the door every day. Yeah. Nice. Have you got any Ironman races on your bucket list that you've looked at and thought, oh, I'd really love to go and do that one? Uh, 
Not really. I haven't really sat down and, you know, really planned out. I would love to go, I think, just from watching some of the Ironman races that they have in Europe. I think something like Frankfurt looks like a, a great race. Um, I think all races in Germany, you know, the country's so supportive and the crowds they get um, for Roth as well. I think yeah. it's uh, those races really excite me with those big crowds. Um, I was actually kind of looking at, you know, I kind of toyed up with the idea of maybe doing Frankfurt earlier this year, obviously before everything got locked down and the season kind of postponed. But uh, yeah, I think I think something in Europe would be fun where, you know, they get those big crowds that are 10 deep. Uh, that's, that's something that's pretty exciting, I think. And it kind of, yeah, it's just enjoyable being out there and everyone yelling and screaming. So, um, yeah. Nice. Now, I know you've been doing a bit of work with uh, our mutual friend, Andy Blow from Precision Hydration in the run-up to Western Australia. Talk to us a little bit about sort of an approach. I'm always fascinated by an approach to sort of nutrition and hydration and stuff like that for the long distance races, especially when it's hot. Um, Mm -hmm. How much did Andy help you out in the preparation for that? Because obviously he's a guy who's got a fair bit of knowledge on how to race over the long distance, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I got introduced to Andy through my coach, Matt Dixon, um, who's also uh, an Englishman. Um, And I felt like I had a pretty good grasp on uh, hydration and nutrition for 70.3. But with Ironman, there's just no room for error um, with your hydration. If If you're under hydrating or over hydrating in a 70.3, you can get through it. You know, you're not going to see um, the repercussions of under hydrating in a 70.3 until maybe the back end of the run where you're almost home. But in an Ironman, I didn't want to get, you know, have a, have a bad day out because I didn't hydrate properly. So I kind of, yeah, I just spoke to Matt and he introduced me to Andy and then, yeah, we had quite a few chats on the phone, Andy and I just, um, yeah, about hydrating and things like that. I did one of the sweat tests as well. Um, where you go in and they, um, I forget what the machine is, but yeah, they essentially test your sweat and sodium concentration and, uh, and sweat rate. And that can kind of give you an idea of how much sodium you're losing. Um, what did you come out at? Do you remember? We'll do a competition here I, to hear was saltiest. I was quite low. Um, Were you? Okay. I would have to, I think, was it 600 and something? Does that okay. sound right? Yeah, 600 that milligrams yeah. per liter. Yeah. Um, so, which is great, um, for those hot races, so, yeah. you know, maybe that bodes well for a, a good, for Kona, Hawaii. Yeah. In a few years. It? but, um, yeah, it was quite low and Andy was, uh, you know, pretty pleased with that. Obviously a lower sodium concentration means, um, yeah, you don't have to replace as much. Um, so yeah, I had those numbers and I kind of knew how, how, how much I would sweat, how many liters of sweat I'd lose an hour. And I kind of just tried to offset that for the, for Bustleton, uh, set, uh, Ironman. And it went pretty well, actually. I feel like I didn't, um, yeah, I didn't have any problems with my nutrition or hydration, uh, at all. So yeah, full, full credit to Andy and the, uh, and the, the program that he implemented. It was great. And, uh, perhaps it might be a little bit different, um, if I'm able to run the last 10 or 15 K properly, instead of stopping at every aid station and hydrating, <laughs> you know, dr- grabbing cups left, right and center. If I'm actually running through the aid stations, it might've been a bit different, but, uh, yeah, 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 it was great. It was great having the support of Andy and PH. I had the, the same test done with Andy years ago and, and he was like, you know, that's, He'd done the test on him, and I think he's 1,800 milligrams or something like that. And he's like, yeah, but I'm ridiculously salty. This is why I started the company. And my result came up, and it was like 1,650. And he went, oh, okay. You're, yeah, pretty similar. Second yeah. place on the leaderboard <laughs> kind of thing. So, uh, so yeah, for, for guys who are really losing the sodium to try and race in the heat, it's hard to describe the difference it makes if you mm-hmm. – yeah, like for me, I raced – a really hot day of the world championships in Almira in 2008. Oh yeah. Crossed mm-hmm. the finish line and woke up four hours later and just like, yeah, didn't know wow. where I was. I was out cold and yeah. it's just all down to lack of sodium on a hot day. So it, mm-hmm. yeah, it can be yeah. a game changer for losers like us. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Although there is, I know there is some people that have really high sodium concentrations that still manage to do pretty well at Kona. So yeah, yeah, I feel like it's just knowing your numbers and um, exactly. trying to. It's having replace. a it's having a plan for it, isn't it? Knowing what it is, and there's no doubt in your mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you're never going to be able to replace what you're losing. Like you're always your expenditure is always a lot more than your intake. It's just kind of about you know minimizing that loss, I guess, as much as possible. And uh, yeah, I guess those people that can minimize it um, as much as possible are the guys that kind of you know really come out in Kona and and do well. Yeah. Well, listen, let's talk a little bit about how the world has changed because obviously there's there's no racing to look forward to on the immediate horizon or maybe not even the you know the medium term horizon. So as a pro triathlete, how have you like adapted your training at the moment with with nothing really on the horizon for you? What have you been doing differently? Yeah, so I I kind of went through a few phases. I guess when it, everything first started kicking off, I I almost um kind of said, oh, you know, it's not so bad. I'll have a bit of time off and a bit of a mental kind of break uh, as such. And I feel like now that it's kind of going on probably longer than what a lot of people have uh, have anticipated and probably will keep going on, in my mm. opinion, for a little bit longer. Um, I'm just kind of heading out now, still training, but I'm not really focusing on fitness and uh, racing games as such. I'm kind of Heading out just for the for the love of of moving, you know what I mean. Um, yeah, for the, I do. For the love of cycling, I've been getting out on my gravel bike a ton. Um, which at this time of year, I'm usually on my TT bike, you know, ninety yeah. percent of the time doing doing efforts or things like that, or just wanting to be in the TT position. But yeah, I've been on my gravel bike pretty much exclusively and just finding new trails. I know gravel riding's kind of a bit of a bit of a hit a craze at the moment but you can definitely see why it's it's just uh you know there's something about getting off road and for me the solitude of it as well is quite nice being away for three or four hours and not seeing anybody else um yeah it's kind of kind of nice to just get out and just be out there for the love of cycling you know it's almost a primal um feeling that you know takes you back to the to the roots of cycling which is kind of nice you're not focusing on power you're not focusing on time or distance or things like that and i guess the same goes for running as well i've been hitting the trails like actual trail running a little bit more than i probably would um at this time of year usually i'm doing you know efforts or trying to prepare for races so i'm not getting off and doing those steep trail runs um but yeah i guess just doing things that um that I wouldn't usually get to do. And I've, I've really been enjoying that to be honest. And I'm still getting out and doing some hard sessions on the road bike and things and still going out and doing some hard runs, but yeah, kind of more just focusing on the love of moving and the love of exercise, I guess, rather than fitness or racing goals, which is, it's been nice, but I do, I do miss having those goalposts to work towards, you know, uh, I'm a racer at heart and that's that's what I love and that's what I do for a living. So it's kind of some days I do I do miss that kind of structure that I have of a of a set program and going out and hitting numbers and things like that, but at the same time sometimes it's nice going out and just just being out there, you know. Yeah. It feels like there's it feels like there's been a bit of a reset. It feels like you've got an opportunity to have like a 3 to 6 month fun base building period where you're just out exercising still but there's no there's no pressure to hit any kind of metrics mm-hmm. and yep. i really think a lot of people are gonna come out of this certainly healthier because no mm-hmm. one's stressed out trying to chase performances mm-hmm. yeah yeah exactly sorry that's my yeah. dog barking in the background what's your dog called <laughs> his name's rufus rufus um, yeah, Welcome to the podcast, animal. Rufus. <laughs> more than <laughs> my my eight year old son has been on the show more times than he just wanders um, in the background. Dad, I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We uh, we rescued him uh, not that long ago, actually, about a month ago. So he's, okay, uh, he's uh, five months old. Um, what kind of yeah, dog? He's, been a, he's a lab mix. Okay. Um, nice. Yeah, I think he's a lab mixed with some collie or something like that. So. Oh, yeah, he's, nice, a, he's a he's a good little boy. He's going to be a, a running and trail running partner for sure. Me and me and my wife love getting out there on the trails and uh, taking him out when we can. So 
Awesome. Um, but yeah, sorry, what were we, we were talking about? Uh, the, uh, yeah, the coronavirus and everything being shut down. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like it has been a bit of a reset. Uh, um, you know, there's some people and everyone copes in different ways. I can appreciate that. There's some people that are still out there training really hard and still, you know, and who knows, racing could come, come back really quick and quicker than we expected. But yeah, in my mind, I'm kind of leaning towards racing, you know, and potentially, um, best case scenario at the, towards the end of the year. And, um, yeah, I just want to make sure that I'm going to be ready for that. You know, I'm the kind of athlete that has almost like a set, a set amount of mental reserve for each season and training hard and being strict on training and diet and uh, things like that. I feel like that dips into that mental reserve. Uh, so I'm trying to keep that as full as possible at the moment for uh, for when the racing does kick off. I'm going to need to tap into those uh, that mental reserve and, uh, yeah. That's uh, that's kind of the way that I look at it, anyway. You've not been tempted into any any of these sort of Zwift races that are going on. Not really, but in saying that, I am actually. <laughs> I did get invited. They're having a Zwift uh, Invitational, which is four races, uh, and it starts next Wednesday. So, yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully the the legs have still got a bit of power in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know some of those guys are smashing it on the Zwift races. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's a, a great initiative. You know, if people, like I said, everyone copes in different ways. People can get that kind of competitive edge out on those uh, those Zwift races, and I did a couple of them, and I do enjoy them. They're fun, but um, yeah, it, it's it, it's hard. That's for sure. Yeah, man. Hey, well, listen, that's probably a, a pretty good place to leave it, mate. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for your time, and um, I'm looking forward to watching your race results over the next couple of seasons as the as the season manages to kick back in again. Yeah, yeah, me too. Hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to getting back out there. And uh, as I said, yeah, racing is what we do and it's what we love. So hopefully, it won't be too much longer. And hopefully, you get to take Rufus out on the trail sometime soon as well. Hey, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> All right, buddy. Thank you very much. Thanks for that, Rob. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, cracking interview there with Sam Appleton. Really enjoyed chatting with him. Just imagine going out there in your first Ironman, feeling feeling like you're underdone and coming out of the water next to Ali Brownlee and just doing turns with Ali Brownlee on the front through and off. Coming in, I think they rode the bike. It was certainly under a 410 bike split. And then... Setting off on the run at four minute Ks and Ali Brownlee runs away from you. I think he, he went through in something insanely fast, like 117 at the halfway point. And yeah, closing it out for a, an 809 in your first Ironman. That's uh, pretty talented right there. And I think we're going to see a lot more of Sam in the very top end of results over the coming seasons there. Really nice chap. And obviously, really enjoys his racing, really enjoys his training, seems to be doing it for the love of the sport at the moment rather than, you know, for the need to be racing, which which is great. I really like it when someone's racing from the heart like that. Yeah, so good times. That pretty much brings us to the end of this week's show, everybody. I just want to say thank you very much to this week's sponsors. Remember, we've got some deals and discount codes for you. You can use the code OxygenAddict15 for 15% off your first electrolyte order at precisionhydration.com. Obviously, we just had a chat there about the effect, the positive effect they've had on Sam's racing. You can use the code OxygenAddict10 at Thriver.co for 10% off all home blood test subscriptions. And if you're looking for triathlon coaching, get over and visit teamoxygenaddict.com. We've got all manner of exciting coaching goodness going on over there for you at the moment. Um, and if you're interested in giving it a bit of a try, come and join us on our Zwift ride Tuesdays at 7.15 p.m. UK time. Just check out in the official events section of the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast Power Hour in the event section in Zwift. I think we're one of the only uh, one of the only external organizations to have an official Zwift event like that one. So we've often got 130, 140 riders all on together doing one of our uh, one of our interval sessions together and it definitely 
Firstly, it makes the power come easier. And secondly, it makes the suffering seem less if there's a hundred odd other people around you really working hard at the same time. So come on, give it a try and uh, guarantee to raise your FTP and give you a more powerful bike leg for the next time you race. Remember, guys, there's links in the show notes for all of these sponsors so you don't have to remember them. Until next week, have a great, safe training and virtual racing week. I'm Coach Rob Wilby, and you've been listening to the Oxygenetic Triathlon Podcast. See ya. Thank you.